you know, I've been praying about, uh, you know, next week is Palm Sunday, which would be like in, in the Bible where Jesus comes into town and everyone's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, waving the palm branches. The week after that, we'll be out at the racetrack. That's Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. That's typically where we would um, be preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. Oh, oh and we will. D- don't get me wrong. But as I've been praying and asking the Lord, like, where do you want us to be in the scriptures as we are, are kind of talking through and preparing our hearts and following Jesus on the journey to the resurrection? We need to start this week prior to Palm Sunday and Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Like, what's a catalyst moment in the life and ministry of Jesus that was so important to all of those other things happening? And the Lord kind of directed me to the story of Lazarus. And his death and resurrection, Jesus calling him out of the tomb and performing the miracle after the fourth day of him being dead, bringing him back to life. And as I began to study and just pray through this, the Lord, I I believe that the Lord is directing me to actually spend the next three weeks in the story of Lazarus, ending on Easter Sunday with Jesus bringing life back to Lazarus as a picture of the life that Jesus was about to bring to us through his death and resurrection. So I think that's what's happening here. And so we're going to start with the first third, first little portion, first seven verses of that story today, and we're going to build on it over the next couple of weeks and looking at this this work that Jesus is doing and the many things that we can see. This is is the gospel of Jesus Christ summarized in a moment in Jesus' ministry. And we're going to get a, have a front row seat to the realities of what was going on in this moment and, and, and the painful stings of how much of it we are living through right now in our lives, but hopefully it keeps our gaze focused on the fact that, listen, the blood of Jesus has been applied to all of our sin for those who believe. It's because he has died and because he has been raised to new life that we too, that we too can be set free, that we too have the hope of heaven for those who believe, that we too, as Pastor Cameron said, can be called sons and daughters of God again. And so as we step into the story of Lazarus, um, we pick up in John chapter 11, and this is what goes down. Now, there was a certain man, not just any man, but this certain man was ill, and this certain man was a well-known man by Jesus and the disciples and his community, and his name was Lazarus. Say Lazarus. Lazarus was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, the Mary that we're talking about here is the Mary who anointed the Lord with the oil, remember that, and then wiped his feet with her hair. It it was her sister who was Martha, and it was also her little brother who was Lazarus. Now, it was that Lazarus that was sick, is what we find out here in verse 2. Very, very, very sick. So the sisters got together, and they started to come up with this idea that our little brother Lazarus is really sick, and we just happen to have a really close friend who might be able to do something about this because we've tried every doctor in town. We have tried to do all the family remedies. Nothing has happened. And so conveniently for us, we have a close friend that every time he travels through our village, he stays at our house. We've had meals together. We've laughed and cried around the fire together. And his name is Jesus, and he's the only miracle worker that we know, so let's reach out to him. So they write him a note on a piece of papyri. Some of y'all got that. God bless you. Thank you for the one laugh over here. I thought that was a good papyri. I never Forget it. Never mind. They write him a note on a napkin, for those of you Americans in the bunch here. They hire a runner because Jesus is about 30 miles away. This guy's going to have to run an ultra marathon. Hands the napkin to the guy, hires the guy. The guy takes off running, finally finds Jesus. The note that they had written said these exact words, and I quote, Lord, he whom you love is ill, period. And that was it. And the guy runs, he finds Jesus, took him about a day to get there. When Jesus finally gets the note, Jesus opens the note, reads the note, and says out loud, this illness does not lead to death, even though it would temporarily. But listen closely, Grace. But this illness is, it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Pay close attention to that. We'll come back to it. 
Now, Jesus loved Mary and her sister Martha and their little brother Lazarus, loved them very dearly, close friends of his. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was, and then after he had said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Uh, I imagine you picked up on this, and, and if you've read the story at all in John 11 of Lazarus, he, he ends up dying from the sickness. Jesus shows up to the tomb, shows up super late to the funeral, um, but ends up like calling him out of the tomb. Pretty crazy story. Pretty exciting story. And there's a whole reason why it all went down the way it all went down, and we'll just start chipping away at it over these next few weeks. But at this particular moment of the story, they didn't know that this was going to turn out in such a miraculous way. All they knew was Lazarus was sick to the point of dying. I mean, they had already tried it all. They had already called in all the help they could call in, yet Lazarus was so sick, he's knocking at death's door. So they think to himself, let's call our one miracle working friend. Let's send a note to him, let him know what's going on. And we're so close to him, sure. I mean, he's stayed at our house every time he travels through Bethany. So like, surely he'll come through for us, right? And so they send this letter to Jesus. And I don't know if you noticed the letter and how it was written or even thought about what kind of letter you would send to Jesus in a desperate situation, but their letter said this, Lord, the one whom you love is ill, period. Toodles, Mary and Martha. Now, when I'm in a desperate situation, I don't know about y'all, and I go to God and I send a message to him through my prayers, it is a heck of a lot more persuasive than that. I mean, did you just know? It was almost benign what they said, almost, you know, presumptuous, like, hey, the one whom you love is ill. Do something about it. Uh, when I pray and I'm in the fourth quarter of some desperate situation and I got to have God move quickly, especially when you, this is a two-day layover they're looking at here. It's going to take a day to get the letter to Jesus. And once Jesus gets it, if he drops everything and leaves right now, it's going to take a day to get back. They're already losing two days in this whole process. Like, if I was sending a prayer or a message to Jesus and my little brother was dying and I needed a miracle working Savior to show up and do something about it, I feel like I would say a little more than that, wouldn't you? I mean, my prayers sound a little more like this. Uh, Dear Jesus, you know I love you. And now that we're past that, I got a problem. My little brother is sick and we need a miracle. Now you know him because you're close with him and every time you stay in Bethany, you stay at our house. Remember, he gives up his room so you and your disciples have somewhere to stay. And Lazarus, who has just served you throughout your ministry and your life, like every time you come around, he's the, he's the one that gathers the volunteers from the community to make sure that the, the, the carpet's rolled out for everything that you are doing on behalf of the kingdom of God. And like Lazarus, he's just one of the good guys, you know? I mean, he's loved by the community. He's loved by you. I mean, you know how awesome he is. Like, just imagine the devastation in our family and in our community if Lazarus isn't here. So Jesus, if you don't mind, we're running out of time. We need you to come and perform a miracle with Lazarus. You're the only one that can do it. Sincerely, Mary and Martha, P.S., it's an emergency. Hurry up, please. That's how I pray. But that's not what they did at all, was it? It's peculiar that in such a desperate situation, they say, the one whom you love is ill, period. You know, as we look through the life and ministry of Jesus and the people that are closest to him on a personal level, like Mary and Martha, I mean, longtime friends, have had many meals together, know each other very intimately, just like Lazarus. I, it's interesting to me that they don't present Lazarus' resume to Jesus to try to persuade him to move and to act like I do in my prayers. It's interesting to me that they don't try to make a big deal about all that Lazarus has done and try to over-verify to Jesus how much Lazarus loves Jesus and has served Jesus. They don't show up to Jesus with his resume at all. They say, Lord, the one who you love is sick. 
And it's this reoccurring gospel truth that happens in the scriptures that I don't want you to miss. It seems like the people that are closest to Jesus all throughout the Bible are more fixated on his love for them than they are on their love for him. They're more fixated on his love for them than on their love for him. John, for example, who wrote this book, every time, you know, John who records this story, every time John introduces himself or refers to himself, all throughout the book of John, he refers to himself in the third person and he calls himself, ha, he calls himself the disciple who Jesus loves. And like God let it be in the book. I mean, imagine, I'm going to meet lots of folks that I've never met before this weekend that are coming to Grace, and, and you're going to introduce yourself, Bob, Jim, Sally, Sue. Nice to meet you, Bob and Jim and Sally and Sue. I'm Dustin, the pastor who Jesus loves. <laughs> and you're not going to come back, you know. You get it? Isn't that weird? But John does it all throughout his book, not once, not twice, not thrice, but five times throughout the book of John. And it's almost as if God, as he's watching him write it, says, well, can't argue with that. Go ahead on. And he lets it be in the book. Because there's something about the people that were closest to Jesus that knew his love for them mattered far more than their love for him. It's John that actually goes as far as saying this incredible gospel truth in 1 John 4, 19 that says, we love God because he first loved us. But yet, we forget that gospel reality and we run to Jesus with our resume. We forget that it's not our worthiness that moves him to act. It's who he is. It's his worthiness. It's his love for you. It's his staggering, undenying, undefinable love for you that moves him to act. Mary and Martha understood that. Um, the one who you love is sick, period. Sinned. And that was it. It was also John that recorded the words that Tim Tebow wrote in John 3.16. All right, that was a joke and only one of y'all laughed. Maybe that was a bad church joke, I don't know, but I thought it was funny. Tim Tebow didn't write any of the Bible, believe it or not, okay. But the good news is I actually have this verse memorized because I am the pastor whom Jesus loves. And it goes like this. Now, one day you'll get to the place where I am and you'll have this memorized too. But it goes like this. It was John that recorded Jesus saying to Nicodemus, saying, God so loved the world, so loved the world, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. It was John who wrote that. John is trying to emphasize to us over and over and over again we love him because he first loved us. That's the motivating factor. That's what we can trust in. We can't trust in our performance and our resume. That's not, we're not going to arm twist a yes out of God because of our good behavior and trying to impress him with our love for him. It's his love that motivates us to love him, and it's his love that is, supply, is the supply every step of the way. It's his love. And he so loved the world. You know, when, when, he, when he says that word, the world, in their ancient language, he wasn't talking about the globe like in its actual construct. It's the word cosmos. It's where we get our word cosmetics. God so loved everything that he had created on the world. Uh, specifically, the world he's referring to there is wicked and sinful humanity. For God so loved wicked and sinful humanity. Let me simplify that so make it easier. For God so loved bad people. For God so loved, he didn't just love them. We could have said, he could have got away with God loved bad people. God so loved bad people. The word there is this ancient Greek word that means agape love. It's a love that only God possesses and can only come from God through you. You can't conjure this up on your own. 
It's a love that is so relentless that it needs no reciprocation. He's going to love regardless of how you respond. That's a kind of love we can't connect with very well because our love is phileo love. I love you as long as you love me. I, I do a lot of weddings, believe it or not. Bride and the groom, they stand up there all googly-eyed at one another. Oh, we're so perfect. Our life's going to be perfect. Our marriage is not going to be like anybody else's. It's going to be the best one in town. Yes, it will. And <clears throat> why God calls us into heavenly covenant in this thing called marriage is meant to be agape covenant, which is this relentless, undenying, undying love that needs no reciprocation, agape love. That's what he calls us to into his kingdom covenant as believers who get married. The reality is we step into the altar, and I see it over and over and over again, what we're, what we're committing to is phileo love, brotherly love. We're saying, yeah, I do as long as you do, and yeah, I will as long as you will. We have conditions on our love, but agape love has none. Agape love is relentless regardless of whether it's reciprocated or not. And John tells us in John 3.16, for God, agape so loved the world. So loved the world that was going to reject him and deny him and ignore him, worship other gods, try to explain away his existence, take credit for his miracles, and ultimately just reject him altogether. Wide is the path to destruction, Jesus says. God so loved a world that was going to reject him anyway that he gave his only son, Jesus. So that whoever, whoever, whoever among those rejectors believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's a love story of God and it shows up right here in the beginning of the story of Lazarus. Just this significant, extraordinary love. Well, Mary and Martha send a letter to Jesus in verse 3 and says, the one who you love is ill. And the word that they use, the one who you phileo is ill. Brotherly love. The one who you reciprocate love to because you're close and you're good friends. He's, he's really sick. He needs you. Come on and see what you can do about that. But we see uh, uh, John say in verse 5, now Jesus, look closely, verse 5, now Jesus loved, say loved. That's agape right there. The letter said, hey, you phileo, my brother. You brotherly love him. Why don't you come and help? But John's response when he describes, he says, Jesus agape them, a relentless love that needs no reciprocation. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. This undenying, bigger love than we could ever ask for or imagine from God. He had that kind of love for Martha and Mary and Lazarus and you and for me. And he's so in love with them that when he finally gets this note, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, Man, you can't love more than Jesus loved. When he finally got the note and he read it, he dropped everything and he ran to them. He canceled all of his appointments. He, he, he walked past other people that need to be healed and he rushed back to get to Lazarus. No, that, that ain't what happened. Jesus so agape Martha and Mary and Lazarus that when he got the news that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. What, did somebody make a mistake here? That doesn't even make sense. I thought people who were deeply loved by God were supposed to get him to move quicker. Like, what's up? Can't you get the sense of urgency in this Jesus? I mean, <clears throat> you know it took a day for this letter to get to you all the way from Bethany. It's going to take a day for you to get back to Bethany at least. We got a two-day layover period here. And Jesus kicks around for two more days just to waste in time. I mean, what was he doing that was so significant that it stalled him? Well, I can tell you this. It must have been so insignificant that John didn't bother writing it down. What is he doing? Was, was he just... Was he just stalling? Like, are you waiting? Like, hey, hey, listen, Grace Bible. Even when it looks like Jesus is up to nothing, he's always up to something. But let me just ask you real quick, though. I wonder how many of you are in a situation in your life right now where it feels like Jesus is making you hurry up, hurry up and wait for no daggum good reason. 
Like, come on, man. Can't you see the sense of urgency in this situation? I mean, come, let's, let's go. You see it. I see it. What are you waiting for? Some of Jesus' closest friends can identify with that feeling. They identify with it exactly. Jesus lets us in a little bit on what he's up to while it seems like he's up to nothing, and we see it in verse 4. And in verse 4 it says, Now when Jesus heard the news about Lazarus and what the notes said, Jesus' response was the illness, this illness doesn't lead to death, even though it would temporarily. But this was the point. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Um, Cam was just reading out of the book of Daniel about the ancient of days. That was incredible. I know that didn't come from you. I know it came from the Lord. But dang, boy, you had me in the throne room of heaven for a second there, homie. <sighs> Daniel prophesied a couple chapters after chapter 7. Daniel prophesied in chapter 9 that there was going to come a day when the Messiah would arrive. He, he's the only of the prophets. Lots of the Old Testament prophets spoke of him. All of the Old Testament prophets were speaking, alluding to him. But Daniel actually gave us this math equation that the people of Israel would have been familiar with. And that math equation, depending on how you translate it, either gets Jesus arriving um, at at this particular point in history, like this Mary and Martha season that we were in, or some would say, and I believe, as I do the math, it actually predicts the day that Jesus was going to arrive as Messiah. That, that day just so happened to be what would be for us next weekend, Palm Sunday, which gives explanation as to why there were so many people at the mouth of Jerusalem waving palm branches when Jesus shows up riding side saddle on a donkey shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Like Daniel gave us the math equation. We circled the date on our calendar and here we are and here you come. And I mean, you don't look much like a warrior king, but maybe you're it. So Hosanna, Hosanna. Now, since there was so much anticipation, though, that the Messiah was going to come either that day or around that time period, you better believe that at that particular point in history, there were plenty of other self-proclaimed messiahs who wanted to go ahead and get the glory, the fame, the riches, the following. Many of them had come throughout that particular point in history. Some had even died for the sake of their false claims of messiahship, which makes sense that Jesus comes in under all that fanfare with their anticipation, this must be the day, and that it only took about three days for the Hosannas to turn into crucify hymns. It's another fraud, another liar. Because of all these messiahs of the time, the rabbis at that particular point in history, they had to sit down and figure out, like, well, how are we going to know when the real one gets here? How are we going to be able to differentiate the frauds from the authentic Messiah, the promised one of God? So rabbis kind of on their own accord, they came up this rabbinic tradition that there would be four miracles that only the Messiah, the appointed one of God, would be able to accomplish. Only four. And the four miracles that they decided for themselves that only the Messiah, the appointed one of God, would be able to accomplish are as follows. Miracle number one, only the true Messiah would be able to heal a Jewish leper, specifically a Jewish leper. We see Jesus do that many times, but one of the times, Luke chapter 5, 12, when he specifically heals a leper that was Jewish, not only by birth, but by faith. The second miracle that the rabbis of the day had concluded that only the real Messiah would be able to cast out a mute demon, one that seizes your ability to speak. We see Jesus do that when he comes down off the Mount of Transfiguration and the little boy who was unable to speak and it kept throwing him into the fire. Jesus casts him out through fasting and prayer. That happens in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Rabbinic tradition miracle number two, Jesus fulfills. Only the true Messiah, number three, rabbis of the day concluded only the true Messiah would be able to heal someone that had been blind since birth. And one thing to heal somebody that was blind, but it's a whole other thing to build, heal somebody that was born blind. 
which Jesus does in John chapter 9. And last but not least, rabbis of the day concluded that only the true Messiah, only the true appointed one of God, would be able to raise someone from the dead after three days. And that brings us all the way back into this moment where Jesus opens the envelope and there it is, the note. The one whom you love is ill, period. Jesus knew it was coming. And let's be honest, he's Jesus. He could have healed Lazarus from 30 miles away. No problem. But instead, he waits. He stalls. He's got a day trip ahead of him just to get back, but he kicks around for two more days. See, Jesus knew that the death and resurrection of Lazarus was going to lead to his death and then his resurrection. And then that was going to lead to death itself getting a death sentence and losing its sting forever. You know, when it feels like Jesus is up to nothing, he's always up to something. As a matter of fact, we see after Jesus' resurrection of Lazarus, the chief priest in chapter 12, you can read about this, the chief priest then set out to kill Lazarus and kill Jesus. It was the resurrection of Lazarus that set this whole thing in motion that gets us to the great day of resurrection where Jesus himself conquered death so that we ourselves could no longer see death as an enemy, but as a gateway to finally being with the one true king forever. He's up to something here. They couldn't see the end of the story yet, though. They were right in the middle of the loss. They were right in the middle of the waiting on God. They, they didn't realize that life was going to be born out of death. They didn't realize that what Jesus was going to accomplish would be more than they could ever ask or imagine. They wanted Jesus to heal Lazarus from a disease so that he could be made well. They had no idea Jesus was going to bring him back from the dead. And as a picture, invite all of us from death to life because Jesus would be the one to finally conquer death once and for all. I hope that even in these first seven verses, the beginning of the story make clear to you that even if you love Jesus deeply and are deeply loved by Jesus, life's still going to be a mess. That's why it's called life, not heaven, partner. Hope somebody's told you already. But if you haven't, here it is. Life's going to be a mess. Jesus didn't promise anything otherwise. It's, it's our bad religion that have made Jesus out to be the God of our comforts. When in reality, Jesus told us himself, John 16, in this world you will have trouble, partner, and a pile of it. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't feel like it right now, though, does it? Man, it's heavy. And we're on a time crunch. And, and I, I need Jesus to hurry up. And since he doesn't seem to be moving at the time frame that I'm moving at, I need to persuade him with my resume of love for him and everything that I plan to do for him, if he'll fix this for me, and I'll make all my negotiations with God, forgetting that all the people that was closest to Jesus, they were fixated on his love for them more than they ever were on their love for him. I'll be honest with y'all. I really don't have a problem trusting God. I trust God. I really do. I just trust God. And I don't mean as, oh, look at him. Look at the preacher boy up there. Then he trusts God in church. And his life ain't as hard as mine, yeah. I really do trust God, but I don't trust his timing worth a lick. I don't trust his methods. And I guess if I don't trust his timing and I don't trust his methods, then maybe I don't trust God so much. 
I love it when Jesus sweeps in in the fourth quarter of our hard thing and, and rescues us right in the last second because he's an on time God. Yes, he is. I love when that happens. But what about when he stalls? We miss the deadline and it's too late. Thanks, God. We, we start to bring into question his existence and his love for us and, and, and all of the above. Our faith starts to wane. We start to wonder if he ever cared or if he even exists or whatever. And Jesus told us, he says, this thing through earthly lenses is going to look like a fat old mess. But through heavenly lenses, it is bringing glory to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And I wonder if your story is in that situation right now. You're waiting for him to sweep in, and I hope he does. But I want to remind you that some of Jesus' closest friends didn't get that either. And Jesus waited too long. And the deadline passed, and the hardship hit, and the bone-crushing grief settled in. And all the doubt and wonder, we'll talk about that next week when we look closely at Mary and Martha. And all the doubt and wonder has now crept in and we're wondering, God, where are you? I wonder if for some of you this morning, God is waiting and he's stalling. Not because of a lack of love for you or because your resume is not impressive enough, but it's actually because of his agape, undenying, relentless love for you. Knowing you're going to question him. Knowing you're going to doubt, knowing your faith is going to waver, but yet he stalls because there is something in your life or in your story that he needs to wait to die so that he can breathe new life into your story in a way that you never thought possible and frankly on your own would never ask for. Mary and Martha get it. Your pastor Dustin gets it. I'm living this mess too. I tell you, the old hymn, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. I know we all will. But I think those of you that have had to suffer past the point, of the deadline, have had to trust God when he didn't step in at the last second. I think there's going to be an extra decibel of rejoicing coming from your lungs when you step on that heavenly soil one day. When you finally get to see laid bare before you how God glorified himself through your suffering in such a way that sent ripple effects throughout your family that sent supernatural ripple effects throughout your community that you would never be able to see. And God would never show you because you would mess it up. You'd get in the way and try to help. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Listen, he is for, he, he is for you. He agapes you. He's crazy about you. Loves you so much. In fact, no reciprocation needed. His love is relentless regardless. But do you trust him? That's the question. Are you going to get to enjoy that one who has overcome the tribulation, who has offered a peace that the world does not give, John 16? Are you going to get to enjoy that through your trust in him? Or are you going to wander off and just try to do this thing by yourself because he was too late? I'm giving up on him. Forget about that. I'll go be the only, the, my own God in my own little circle. Let me just help you out. That ain't going to work. Because you're going to let you down way more than you feel like God has. Let's pray about that. Because I know we are walking in it this morning. Or some of us are concerned that that might be our story. Some of us are living in it. Some of us know that that's our situation. We've already called into question the judgment seat of God on our stuff. But Lord, you are God and you are king, O ancient of days. Lord, would you inspire the trust in us and the hope in us that we might be able to cling to the vine that is Jesus and drink deeply of the well that is his love for us, even though our circumstances are a wreck. Uh, Lord, would you 
be the hero of the day. I, I do pray that you would sweep in as the hero of the day in such a way that we're so impressed by your faithfulness yet again. But God, I know for some you will stall because there's something you are putting to death in order to bring new life. We don't like that one. But I know that that is as much glorifying to you as us getting our way. Lord, align our hearts with yours. Be our extra mile of comfort and peace and resilience. Help us see a glimpse of your glory being revealed in our hardship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.